I specialize in pushing the limit. <laughs> so perhaps that'll be the theme of the next uh, two topics. Uh, I'm going to talk about DCS as well as LC, uh, invasive libel carcinoma, um, but uh, the focus of it will be on data that I have to present regarding the use of target in the uh, treatment of DCS. I'd like to start by uh, thanking my uh, research assistants that uh, sort of do the work of providing data to me that, uh, and also in supporting patient accrual to our trials. Uh, as some of you know, I'm a, a fairly nocturnal surgeon. I'm up late many nights, and, and they receive many emails from me at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning asking for more data. So I appreciate the work. That happened last night as well. So I appreciate the work <laughs> that they do to <laughs> help me get talks together. And I also want to just acknowledge the fact that a lot of the work that I do is supported by a private foundation. So thanks to the patient and, and the donors uh, for enabling uh, me to employ research uh, assistants to, to do the work that uh, allows me to advance what we know about Target and its various applications. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the, the use of, of uh, Target in the management of invasive cancer. Of course, all of us have been parts of, a part of those debates over the last decade. Uh, and now we're actually looking at the use of Target and the treatment of DCS. You saw presentations yesterday that addressed that. But it acknowledges the fact that we have continued this sort of uh, irony of, of being very hesitant to treat DCS in innovative ways and having a double standard about you know, the way that we manage DCS versus invasive breast cancer. That's reflected in the, the ASTRO guidelines where we have this sort of very conservative subset of patients with DCS which, that we're allowing to treat, but we're much more liberal, if you will, in treating invasive breast cancer when DCS is a much less life-threatening condition and as the NIH considers it, it's not even cancer. They think it's a sort of a, it's something that can develop into cancer, but many of us don't even consider DCS cancer. This is all happening at the same time that we're debating whether or not patients with DCS need any treatment at all. You know, maybe just tamoxifen or re removal without radiotherapy. There are various treatments that can be done, and they all are under investigation, but the key thing is that we need to be open-minded about how we uh, manage patients, uh, and we should be open to exploring the use of DCS, the, the use of target and the management of DCS. Now, this is one publication that sort of helped move us forward. It looked at the use of the, the uh, mammocyte approach uh, to management of DCS, and we see with APPI, this form of APPI, analysis of 300 patients from two pooled analysis showed a 2.6 recurrence rate 2.6% recurrence rate at 57 months, which is very similar to what we saw in the target trial for invasive breast cancer. So it at least opens the door, again, to the use of EBI for the management of DCS. But we've been slow in generating data for IRT in the management of DCS, and I hope to share some of that with you in a moment. Now, we get some indirect indication that IRT, and particularly target, might work for DCS if we look at the target A trial. It was a randomized trial of invasive cancer, but as you well know, most patients or many patients with invasive cancer have coexisting DCS. Uh, in the target trial, 50% of patients in both arms had DCS as well as their invasive cancer, and yet you saw in the prepathology group equal recurrences, low rates, 2.1 versus 1.1%. The target was able to control not only the potential for invasive cancer recurrence, but also the potential for DCS recurrence in these patients. So it's working. It didn't work only against the, uh, the invasive component. So the challenge, I think, for DCS is not really a biological challenge. It responds to radiation, and it responds to partial breast radiation and target as well. But it's really an anatomical ca challenge. Can we identify patients that have limited enough disease that you can resect with clear margins, leaving a low burden of disease in the perimeter uh, to allow you to offer that patient a very targeted dose of radiotherapy? So this is really a challenge. Finding patients that don't have this problem either macroscopically or microscopically, that can be a source of a recurrence. Uh, we also have some evidence that people are already using uh, Target to treat uh, DCS. This is the Target retrospective publication. We mentioned it yesterday. It was a publication of 800 patients receiving uh, Target, predominantly for treatment of invasive cancer in the community setting, but there were 9% of patients in this uh, study that had D Target for DCS alone. So 
it's clear that some of you are embracing it, but we need more data, we need more time, and I hope to share some of that, uh, I plan to share some of that. Uh, a few years ago, I published this paper. It was mentioned yesterday. This is analysis of 35 patients treated with target for DCS, uh, at which point we uh, he had a median follow-up. I can't exactly remember what it, what it was, but I'm going to update it. But we had about 5.7% recurrence rate uh, in this group uh, in a mixed population of both pre- and post-pathology patients. I didn't actually stratify it by pre- and post-pathology because there were too few patients to, to really go through the effort. But we'll do that in the update, and, and you'll, you'll see where that showed. But basically, it involved patients that were enrolled prospectively. It's a non-randomized single-arm analysis. It was it's something that I started at USC and have continued since as, as an interdepartmental protocol for treatment of patients with DCS. All patients have biopsy-proven, core biopsy-proven DCS, uh, or histolo histological confirmed DCS. Uh, we enroll patients with DCS up to four centimeters in size by imaging. Uh, and all patients obviously had to be candidates for breast conserving surgery. Patients underwent a single wire or bracketed wire localization. Uh, the majority of patients were treated in the pre pathology setting, although when the study was initiated, we didn't have it, the information that post pathology treatment was inferior. So we do have some patients in the analysis that were treated in the post pathology setting, but most were treated in the pre pathology setting. Sentinel biopsy was performed only if we suspected that the patient had an invasive component. All patients underwent intraoperative specimen x-rays, and the aim for surgery was to resect the DCS with a 10 millimeter gross margin, uh, but we allowed in the initial study design uh, margins uh, that were two millimeters or greater. So we considered a margin less than two millimeters to be a positive margin. That was ultimately changed, but that was initial definition of, uh, of a negative margin less than two millimeters. And those patients that required re-excision because of a margin less than two millimeters underwent re-excision and whole breast radiotherapy. The primary endpoint of this study was the successful delivery of IRT with the secondary endpoint being local recurrence. The, the reason for this is one of the questions is can we offer target and perform it with a low risk of re-excision in patients because of positive margins. And so we actually set that as our primary endpoint with local recurrence as a second endpoint. So the goal was to at least be able to offer targeted patients and achieve a re-excision rate of less than 15%. If we could do that, then it was worth the effort to offer patients target at the time of uh, the initial resection. This was done in, the, in, in a setting where we've seen publications of 20 to 40 percent re-excision rates for DCS, so we didn't want to subject all patients, you know, 20 to 40 percent of patients to radiation at an initial operation if they were going to be coming back for re-excision. So that's why we set a very th low threshold for allowing re-excisions. Again, the secondary endpoint, which is the one you're most interested in, is a local recurrence rate. Patients were followed semi-annually for the first three years and then annually. Uh, and uh, they had mammograms done at those time points and had MRIs performed as needed in, in the follow-up interval. So these are some of the, uh, the results from the updated analysis, now of 54 patients, there was 35 in, in, in the initial uh, analysis. Uh, as you see, uh, most patients were uh, postmenopausal, but a third of the patients were between 40 and 50 years of age. Um, I've uh, highlighted the, the imaging size, the, ma the maximum uh, dimensions on mammography was uh, up to 20 millimeters for about 70% of the patients, although some patients had larger lesions. Uh, grade, most were actually high in intermediate grade, not low grade. Only 13% of the patients had low grade DCS in this analysis. So I'd like to make the point that I didn't stratify the data by cautionary or, or unsuitable because I actually don't really adopt the astro parameters for defining that. It's my bias in my analysis of this. Uh, and in fact, it, but if you look at the data, you'll see that patients were generally, uh, you know, had larger lesions that were higher grade. Uh, than what would have been what would have been included in the suitable category for for the in, based on the astro guidelines. Uh, there was also about 22 percent of patients that had hormone receptor negative DCS as well. In terms of the pathological size, this is based upon the surgical pathology results. We see that uh, majority of patients had tumors uh, DCS measuring uh, up to three uh, centimeters. Uh, a few had lesions that were more in, in the final resection uh, specimen. Uh, negative margins were achieved in 91% of patients. Uh, and uh, 
about 50% of, 55% of patients, uh, although most were hormone receptor positive, 55% of patients did not take endocrine therapy, tamoxifen therapy after their treatment, after the surgical resection in, in target. So this is the local recurrence rate that you're most interested in. There were 54 patients in this analysis. Uh, there were four recurrences amongst the 54 for a 7.4% recurrence rate when the recurrence rate was not stratified by time of treatment delivery, target delivery. However, when you stratify by the time of treatment delivery, there were 50 patients in the pre-pathology setting, four patients in the post-pathology setting, and when you look at the recurrence rate by timing of treatment, there was a 4%, two out of the 50 in the uh, pre-pathology group that had recurrences. Uh, obviously, that number of 50% of the patients in the post-pathology setting is a little bit high, but we only had four patients in that group, and two of them developed recurrences. Uh, and that gave it a 50% recurrence rate. But as again, we were discontinued offering Target in the post pathology setting very early on and continued to offer it in the pre pathology setting. And as a result of that, we achieved uh, much more reasonable rates of recurrence, 4%, with a median follow up of 45 months for the pre pathology setting. Uh, there were no regional recurrences, no distant recurrences. And just to have a few comments about the patients that recurred. Uh, as I mentioned, there were two patients in the post pathology group that had recurrences. Two, two of the four patients in the post pathology group had recurrences, and one was a 49 year old that had delayed IRT after initially undergoing lumpectomy for DCIS. Uh, she uh, underwent uh, target in 27, uh, uh, she underwent re excision and target about 151 days after initial lumpectomy, uh, and that patient ultimately recurred. Uh, she actually, in, when she underwent target and re-excision, she had margins that were inadequate, less than a millimeter. She had a high-grade lesion. She was a 40-something-year-old, 49-year-old woman. We recommended whole breast radiotherapy after re-excision. She did not decline re-excision. She declined whole breast radiotherapy. 12 months later, she presented with new mammographic findings that yielded a diagnosis of DCS, and she underwent a mastectomy. So uh, she declined the recommended therapy after the initial uh, close, closer positive margin, and she recurred within 12 months of that. The second patient had a diagnosis of ADH on core biopsy. She underwent an excision and was found to have DCS. She underwent uh, a, a re-excision with target given at the time of the re-excision. She was found to have four centimeters of additional DCS at the time of the re-excision. Uh, was again advised to have uh, re-excision, mastectomy, or at least radiotherapy. Declined those as well and recurred six months later. There were two patients in the concurrent group or the pre-pathology group that had recurrences. This is two of the, 40, uh, two of the 50 patients. Uh, the first patient was uh, 58. Uh, she presented with an intracystic papillary carcinoma, underwent a concurrent uh, target at the time of uh, the resection of the papilloma, and recurred uh, was seven years later uh, with an invasive carcinoma in the same breast, same quadrant, underwent re-excision, or rather, a partial mastectomy again, whole breast radiotherapy, followed by tamoxifen, so her breast was able to be conserved following her recurrence. And the last patient was someone who presented at the age of 47 with uh, DCS in the medial left breast. She had a hist history of Hodgkin's lymphoma, had mantle radiotherapy. We offered her a target in a lumpectomy, uh, which was successful initially with widely clear margins, but she presented, uh, uh, was, I can't remember the year, but oh, it's six years later with the recurrence in the same breast, same quadrant, and underwent a mastectomy at that time. Uh, so in summary, we had a 4% recurrence rate. You can see that it, it, it lines up or compares reasonably well to other studies that looked at recurrences with DCS with follow-up periods in the same range, uh, three years to four years, up to five years. Uh, uh, clearly, it's, a, it's a still a small study, limited sample size, but it has longer follow-up than we previously reported and more patients. Uh, we certainly need to have more follow-up, but we'll share and publish the data that we currently have. But it does make the point that I think DCS is a, is a reasonable uh, target, if you will, for, D, for target. Uh, just a matter of patient selection. Uh, we've achieved, I think, excellent local control at uh, four to five months in pre-pathology patients. But clearly, Based upon our small sample size, it, it sort of confirms that post-pathology treatment is inferior. 
Uh, next steps for the DCS group is that I would encourage you all to consider participating in this walk trial. Hopefully it will be approved. Uh, I think it's a great trial, great design, and it will allow us all to, to come on board and, and, and build the data that we need to promote the use of Target for DCS. For those that may not be able to participate in the reg in, in the in SWAG, we'll also have a registry to Target that will enable that. And uh, there's still some discussion that needs to be had about the margins because I think the three millimeter margin requirement is is, is too conservative. I don't have the data to share regarding that, but I think that will be challenged also by the data coming forward. Now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to present not a whole lot of data, but at least some uh, uh, sort of a perspective on the management of target. Uh, management of invasive libel carcinoma with the use of Target. I'll call it ILC because otherwise I, my tongue gets tied. Uh, so, oh, there we go. Uh, one of the sort of double standards we have again, or at least uh, ironies, is that we tend to be much more uh, conservative in our management of invasive libel carcinoma, even though biologically it's no worse disease than invasive ductal carcinoma. It comes with some challenges, but it's not any worse. So as a result of what ends up being sort of an imaging problem primarily, you know, we've pretty much eliminated the patients with invasive lobular carcinoma, the option of receiving partial breast radiotherapy. Uh, and that was true for the target trial as well. Those patients were excluded. Uh, in fact, if you look at the various guidelines, you know, ILC is not included amongst those that are considered to be candidates for APBI. Uh, we excluded it in the target A trial. It was excluded in the target U.S. registry trial, which I discussed yesterday. Uh, it is included in the target boost trial, but then all those patients also get whole breast radiotherapy. They're not allowed to receive IRT alone. Uh, now, the underlying problem, though, is not really a, a biological one. Biological one, but the issue of imaging is that you know it's, it's it's a challenge to find you know suitable patients. I acknowledge that uh, you know with mammography and ultrasound, it often understa understages the extent of disease for patients with invasive lipid carcinoma, but not all. ILC patients have large or extensive lesions. In fact, if you look at analysis, this is one of them that looked at a large number of patients uh, presenting with invasive lobular carcinoma. Uh, only 12% of them had those very large lesions that, with, that presented with architectural distortions that was just impossible to, to estimate you know, the extent of the disease. Uh, in fact, most patients uh, had lesions that were under three centimeters in size. Uh, this actually sort of stratifies the patients by their mammographic appearance of the invasive lobular carcinoma. And you see that for the architectural types, which is the one that is highlighted, 77% uh, of those patients had lesions that were more than three centimeters, which obviously would be a challenge for reverse conservation in general. But all the others, there was only a minority of patients that had lesions that were over three centimeters. So at least raises the question, uh, or opens the door to offering some of these patients a more targeted treatment, target or other forms of APBI. When you look at the biological question, it's even clearer. Invasive lobular carcinomas are less aggressive than, uh, than uh, the, the invasive ductal components. This looks at the overall survival, ILC versus IDC. It's better for ILC than, DC, than for IDC. So, Again, why are we treating these patients more aggressively, if you will? If you look at the local recurrence rate, ILC versus IDC, the same local recurrence rate. Why treat them differently? So, uh, you know, that's kind of, you know, the backdrop. But the truth is that some of us do believe that we can offer selected patients with ILC uh, target or other forms of APBI, and we see that in the mammocyte registry, about 10% of the patients actually did receive uh, mammocyte type treatment for ILC, a, a diagnosis of ILC. In the target retrospective, about 3% of, of the patients received target for ILC. So we are beginning to open the door, uh, and we now have B39, which did include and uh, does include ILC as well. So. The door is opening, but we need to be, uh, I think we need to work together to generate more data for ILC treated with Target. And so I'm going to present to you just a snapshot of a few patients that I treated just for some perspective, but again through cooperation and, and, and uh, of prospective registries which we hope to 
uh, bring forward, we'll be able to uh, generate more data to support the use of a target for IOC. Uh, in my experience, we had, an in, again, a Department of Protocol offering target to patients with uh, tumors that were core biopsy proven IOC, patients age 45 and older, clinically no negative, LVI negative, no EIC, and less than or equal to three centimeters by imaging. And again, all patients underwent traditional workup, including breast MRI, core biopsies, uh, and multidisciplinary consultation. I'm going to just share with you eight patients that underwent uh, target for uh, IOC. Uh, as you can see, most of the patients were over the age of 50. All of them were, in fact. And uh, most patients had lesions that were under three centimeters. In fact, uh, of the ones we presented, seven out of eight had lesions that were under two centimeters by imaging. Uh, histologically, uh, most of the lesions, all the lesions actually turned out to be under three centimeters in size, uh, histologically, so they were a well-selected group. But some of the patients did end up having to have uh, under, undergo mastectomy for uh, positive uh, margins. Um, at the end of the day, we had uh, no local recurrences amongst the eight patients that were treated in, in the trial. Uh, and at least, uh, and as I said, we had uh, two patients that required, uh, I can't quite make that out, uh, three patients that required whole breast radiotherapy based upon the margin analysis. But when you factor out, take into, the, in, 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 take into consideration the fact that six patients were treated with target alone without additional radiotherapy, uh, it does uh, make the point that uh, in the selected way you can identify patients that can be treated, or at least is it, it's hypothesis generating that you can uh, offer a subset of patients uh, target for a diagnosis of IOC and do so with a low risk of local recurrence. So I won't go through all of those slides because I've run out of time, but uh, it's clear that more data are needed as is longer follow-up, but uh, the concept that IRC is just not a candidate for APBI or target, I think, is a flawed one. It's not supported by the biology of disease, uh, and we can select patients that have limited disease that are a candidate for it. I think we should be open to that, and we think we should continue to work together to uh, generate data supporting the use of target in, 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 in a broader subset of patients, including those with ILC.